Um, so uh, today I was uh, kind of thinking about different Grand Rounds presentations, and I decided that I think the uh, the best one that would kind of recapitulate a lot of work that I've, we've done over medical school and residency would be discussing kind of the surgical neuro-oncology advances uh, through the UMBTI. Um, this talk is kind of geared at the fact that the UMBTI was started about 10 years ago, uh, and a lot has happened over the last 10 years. And I kind of highlight a lot of the advances that we've had in Miami, because I think we should be especially proud of these advances as a group that we've uh, accomplished. Um, you know, the slide is very, the, the PowerPoint is very, uh, uh, very superficial. So I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about the research, um, but I'll cover, cover every single aspect of the, uh, of our research um, uh, portfolio so that you can kind of have an idea of what has happened in Miami over the last 10 years and what's to come in the future. So I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, stop me, uh, or if I'm talking too fast, please stop me as well. Um, so uh, just to get a picture, in 2011, um, you know, I was a medical student. I was asking Dr. Green for a lot of different uh, different people I should be uh, doing research with. I kind of emailed a lot of different faculty members uh, in neurosurgery and outside neurosurgery, and I kind of got no responses. At that point, doc Dr. Green said, well, why don't you, you know, you're interested in brain tumors. You should, you know, kind of talk to Dr. Komatar. And, you know, he's coming in from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, you know, I think he'd be a good asset for you to do some research. And, you know, I think uh, in that year, in the fall, we decided to kind of create a small little group of clinical and basic science researchers uh, to kind of highlight some of the research that we're doing at the time and kind of start building a little bit of infrastructure. And that has rapidly uh, increased to a huge uh, amount of people that are involved in the UMBTI from radiation oncology, radiology, neurosurgery, neurology, basic scientists. Um, and this is just a few of the people that are involved uh, in the UMBTI currently. Um, so then you ask yourselves, well, you know, this is a famous Drake quote, you know, started from the bottom, but you know, the, you know, where do, where do you start? You know, if you're 2011, you know, you, you're, you're tasked with the idea of building a brain tumor Institute, you know, where do you start? Um, and I think the, the foundation of every good uh, research project starts with some medical students. And uh, luckily, I think in 2012, we were um, kind of blessed with about 20 or so medical students who kind of came in every single day and kind of we had a big conference room and met every day and discussed different research projects that were going on from viral targets of GBM, serum markers, a vast in use in atypical meningiomas. I mean, we kind of started looking at a lot of different things uh, without really much purpose. Um, I mean, yes, we were able to publish a lot of different systematic reviews on this topic, on these topics in this time period, but uh, you know, a lot of the research we were doing wasn't necessarily that impactful. And this was pretty apparent. Uh, uh, I think Dr. Bhatti and Dr. Harris um, both, you know, separately sat me down like, well, you know, you were writing, you know, a lot of systematic reviews, you know, uh, and a lot of things that may not have a big impact factor. So he was, you know, they basically suggested that, you know, you should really have some pride in your research and think about your research and what, you know, and how you can make an impact on the field rather than necessarily getting a high number of quantity. Uh, and that kind of, you know, really motivated us to uh, think beyond systematic reviews and think about what our research is, what the goal of our research is. And this is important for anybody interested in neurosurgery or interested in doing uh, any type of research in general. Um, and it was very clear that our primary goal should be to improve patient outcomes for our brain tumor patients. So this kind of brings out the idea of phenotyping outcomes in surgical neuro-oncology and understanding which patients are going to benefit from surgery um, and tailoring our treatments for those patients. Um, and in order to do anything, in order to start off and do any type of, you know, research in, in this, in this field, you have to develop an infrastructure. You can't just, you know, uh, you start building, you know, you know, the Sears tower from nothing. So, uh, you have to build an infrastructure. The first thing to do is kind of track your patient outcomes prospectively. And I think everybody kind of, you know, starts off using this Excel kind of sheet where you kind of, you know, add your patients in the Excel sheet and kind of, uh, you know, update their outcomes, you know, you know, with different iterations every year or so. Um, we started off using this system called REDCap initially with Amade, who's now a uh, resident in Buffalo. And this kind of got transitioned to CASIS, which is another type of tumor database. And, you know, it just became very apparent that this was kind of very cumbersome to use and very hard to update continuously. So it kind of circled back now to Excel. And now we're going back to REDCap, actually. So uh, the circle is continuing with uh, figuring out uh, how to track patient outcomes prospectively. But this is an ongoing problem. Um, the next step is basically uh, building a brain tumor bank. And this is really important because any type of research you're doing in any neuro-oncology requires you to have tissue. You have to have tissue and you have to have a large repository of tissue. Um, so in 2011, you can see that, you know, the, the brain tumor acquisition in, a, in the tumor bank was very, very poor. And this rapidly started increasing in 2012, 2013. This is a paper that was published in the, in the um, biopreservation uh, 
uh, journal. And, uh, you know, it's important to know that, you know, does your specimens like kind of re recapitulate the, uh, you know, demographics of the people you're treating. And, you know, you can see here that our bank samples are very similar to this, to the state of Florida bank samples as well. And you have a wide variety of different pathologies so that you have access to that as well. Um, and this has started back in, you know, 2011, 2012, and now still exists today, thanks to a lot of help from Sylvester and their shared um, bio repository resource. Um, and the next step after that is, of course, improving efficiency. Um, so, you have to ask yourselves, you know, in what ways can we improve uh, brain tumor patient outcomes? And you have to think about it from every single step, from the time the patient enters the door, uh, you know, from the time they get the imaging to the time you get your preoperative planning, uh, surgical planning, uh, you know, pathology, radiation oncology, chemotherapy. These are all different avenues and different um, points uh, of care for the, for the patient. And every single one of these needs to be optimized. And every single one of these, uh, you know, you need to have some sort of outcomes that understand is, is there our current treatment modality? Is our current paradigm working or not? And I think that, you know, we've done a good job over the last 10 years of, of kind of improving each one of these um, points of contact. Um, and I'll start off with the imaging. Um, Everyone knows conventional MRI is the workhorse of neuro-oncology. This is kind of where you make your initial diagnosis. You know, you say, okay, well, this is a ring enhancing lesion. What, you know, what it, what's a differential diagnosis? And you kind of move from there. This is pretty standard of care. Um, but the utility of conventional MRI is really limited in contemporaneous neuro-oncology. And you may ask yourself, well, what, what is that? We always order, you know, conventional MRI all the time. But uh, when you're dealing with treatment related changes and uh, more difficult uh, patients, uh, more difficult um, diagnoses, uh, it, the conventional MRI is, is quite limited. Um, the RENO criteria was created uh, about 10 years ago and its utility is you know, quite limited, uh, has a limited diagnostic sensitivity. And you know, to this day, we're still using the RENO criteria to help def to define which patients are responding to treatment and which patients aren't. Um, and, you know, we made this point a few, a few months ago that maybe the renal criteria wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't that good for, uh, um, for treatment related changes. And, you know, there's a need for advanced neuroimaging to supplement, uh, these, uh, these diagnoses. Um, and so here you, um, you know, with, uh, this is some work done with Dr. Benveniste demonstrate that, you know, MR perfusion is a very useful tool in, in, in kind of differentiating treatment, treatment, um, effect and tumor progression. Uh, with a sensitivity of 61%, 88%. Uh, we kind of continue to look at MR perfusion uh, in, um, in a quantitative way and that demonstrated that your uh, relative cerebral blood flow correlated to the active tumor fraction in these recurrent GBM patients. So that kind of gives you a proof of the pudding that, hey, MR perfusion actually does work in uh, quantifying the active tumor fraction in these treated patients. So, you know, proof that, you know, you need advanced imaging in these patients. Um, um, but, you know, we weren't done there. We noticed that the, you know, if you look here, the, the utility of MR perfusion wasn't necessarily that great for metastasis and other types of tumors. So, you know, what, what's the next step here? Um, well, we kind of did a systematic review and said, well, which imaging modality is the best then for these, you know, post-treatment changes. And it was really apparent that MR spectroscopy was probably the best, um, uh, modality for diagnosing treatment related changes with the sensitivity and specificity of 86, uh, and 80% respectively. So with this data, uh, you know, you have to capitalize on the resources you have. Um, and, you know, at UM, a lot of people don't know this, but we have um, probably the most, one of the most sophisticated uh, um, MR spectroscopy um, centers in the country. Um, you know, Dr. Maudsley and Dr. Mohamed Goriwala uh, developed this system for whole brain uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy with help from Emory. Uh, and this is the idea where you basically can put the entire brain and do a uh, MR spectroscopy on the entire brain and get voxels uh, on any region of interest. Um, uh, you know, obviously the utility, obviously the diagnostic um, um, utility of this is is limited in certain areas of the brain, but uh, for most supernatorial areas, this is very useful. Um, so this is the kind of the, the online platform where this data gets uploaded. Um, and then, they, you know, we've used the same system for uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy to basically uh, almost do what we call radio genomics, where you basically can profile tumors based on their choline NAA ratio and determine whether or not they're IDH mutant or IDH wild type. Um, this is just an example of how useful MR spectroscopy can be. Um, uh, this is a patient who uh, was a 65 year old male who came in with seizures. Uh, he had an open biopsy for this kind of multifocal lesion here in the right temporal lobe. Uh, the lesion progressed, you know, um, uh, several months later. Uh, patient started uh, started on chemotherapy um, and radiation, and later was started on a vast and and everolimus 
uh, for this NF1 mutation. Um, but uh, here you can see this is the lesion here uh, in the right temporal lobe back in, in November. But if you look at the imaging very closely, you know, this is the T1, the flare, T2. But if you look at the, uh, the choline NA ratio here using the using this kind of technique for whole brain MR spectroscopy, you see a, a hot point here uh, in the just at the top of the corpus callosum crossing over another hot spot here. And you ask yourself, well, what does that mean? It's not contrast enhancing. You know, the T2 is negative. Uh, is that tumor? Is it artifact? What is that? Um, and you wouldn't even notice this if you didn't have the, the whole brain MR spectroscopy that you ordered. And it does correlate to a, a big uh, choline NA uh, peak. Uh, and if you look at this longitudinally, you can see that there starts to be enhancement two months after this scan. And then, and then within six months after the scan, you see full blown, um, um, full blown, uh, disease in the, in the, uh, uh, in the corpus callosum, uh, sp spreading over to the contralateral side. So, so the use of MR spectroscopy goes beyond just diagnosis. It helps that it could be a, a tool for guided surgical resection. It could be a tool for targeting, uh, radiation fields, uh, and post-surgery, uh, and it could give us an idea of early evidence of treatment failure. So, you know, there's currently some trials going on with Dr. Eric Mellon looking at whole brain MR spectroscopy for radiation. Um, this is in conjunction with Emory as well. So we're looking forward to those results. But I think the next frontier for neurosurgery is maybe even using this for surgical resection. Um, so... So that kind of kind of goes over, well, what, what if the treatment, you know, so then you ask yourselves, well, what if the treatment lesion is incidental or not? So this is a, a tumor that's basically in the, you know, uh, left frontal lobe incidental a patient comes in with headaches and you have this lesion. Uh, what's a, what's the ideal treatment paradigm? Is it a birthmark? Is it a glioma? And we've kind of developed some paradigms for, uh, for treatment, uh, for treatment of these incidental low grade gliomas, whether you offer early surgery or uh, active surveillance and, uh, our research suggested that, you know, these adjuvant treatment modalities such as MR spectroscopy is useful for these uh, incidental lesions and that, you know, you can use, use a, uh, you know, a paradigm for, you know, uh, watchful waiting. But uh, if there's any evidence of glioma on these advanced imaging, uh, early surgical and aggressive surgical resection is warranted. Um, so that's kind of the ideas and this kind of some of the progress we've done, done in the imaging field. Um, as neurosurgeons, obviously, you kind of notice you have a lesion and you kind of start thinking about what the next step is in terms of preoperative planning. Um, you know, we've incorporated uh, a lot of advanced neuroimaging uh, for preoperative planning, including, you know, DTI and functional MRI. Um, this is a patient who had a tumor uh, in the motor strip, uh, and you can see here the motor fibers anteriorly and the sensory fibers posteriorly. Um, and this kind of helped us out decide, you know, which area and which gyrus to enter for, you know, for the resection of this tumor. I mean, you rely on your normal anatomical landmarks, but this kind of helps give you that added, uh, you know, belt and suspenders when you're, you know, deciding for surgical resection for these tumors. Um, and this optimizes your outcomes for these patients as well. Um, beyond just motor mapping, uh, you know, Dan Eichberg uh, and Dr. Ivan have kind of partnered with Dr. Shagru to develop a standard for connectomics at UM. This is extremely interesting because we're doing um, this prospectively on every single patient who comes in through the door with a tumor. Um, so at UMH, you basically have a preoperative DTI for the entire for entire entire brain, uh, pre-op and post-op. So you can see whether or not you know uh, your transcortical route disrupted important um, internal inter fascicles, um, and uh, you can you can correlate that to neuropsychological outcomes. So this is pretty interesting stuff. It's all being done prospectively right now, and there's we've just got IRB approval. So um, you know this is going to be um, you know pretty interesting the next couple of years to see what the connectomics uh, you know how, how how what we're doing in neurosurgery is affecting the connectoma uh, connectoma of patients. Beyond just, you know, preoperative planning, uh, you know, you always have to think about, you know, your surgical, what you do, your effects of what you're doing in surgery as well. So we know that um, maximal safe resection of gliomas is the standard of care and that, you know, ext uh, uh, the extent of resection is associated with improved survival. Now, we've demonstrated previously that, you know, the, using 5-ALA improves your extent of resection for these tumors and that your progression-free survival increases if you re resect more tumor. Um, but this is always, you know, every time you argue this extent of resection argument, you know, they always have a few people, you know, who say, well, you know, this is not really, this is kind of a moot point because there's always tumor cells that are infiltrating beyond the area of uh, tumor resection. And, you know, this is the work by Pat Kelly demonstrating that, you know, you have these isolated tumor cells, you know, several centimeters out from the tumor and that this tumor infiltration is not amenable for surgical resection in the, you know, in the majority of patients. Uh, and so, you know, we, you know, as surgical neuro-oncologists, you kind of fight that back and say, well, listen, you know, there's a lot of data suggesting the super maximal resection 
uh, improves outcomes. Um, this is data from MD Anderson suggesting that resection beyond the flare uh, improves survival in these patients. This is another group in Korea demonstrating that lobectomy uh, in certain situations improves survival. And in from our group, we uh, decided to look at our patients and seeing whether or not uh, lobectomy improves survival as well. Um, and so we looked at you know whether uh, uh, patients who had non-eloquent region GBMs and whether or not lobectomy improved survival in those patients compared to a match con match control co cohort here at UM as well. So we did a intention to treat analysis, um, uh, sorry, an IPTW, IPTW analysis, which is an inverse uh, proportion weighted uh, treatment analysis to see whether or not, uh, you know, lobectomy would confer survival benefit for, compared to patients who just got lesionectomy alone. And our results were pretty impressive that uh, the overall survival in patients who got lobectomy were 30 months compared to those who had just gross total resection alone, which is around 14 months. Um, and that's kind of expected given the data from the STU protocol. Um, so our data suggested that the lobectomy and supermaximal resection should almost be a standard if possible for non-eloquent region uh, GBMs. Um, uh, beyond lobectomy, you know, you, know you, you think about it and you think, say, you, you tell a patient, oh, well, lobectomy is, you know, it seems like a pretty morbid approach, but, you know, we've demonstrated that this is even feasible through a keyhole approach. I mean, you can look here, this is a, uh, the extent of a craniotomy for a temporal lobectomy. And this is the idea of using this kind of keyhole approach to make room uh, as you start your case. Uh, this is a paper published by Javier um, looking at this, just describing this technical, uh, the, the technique of a keyhole lobectomy for temporal, um, for temporal gliomas. Um, so, okay, that's all, that's all, that's all great. But what if a super maximal resection is not feasible? Um, you know, I think we've demonstrated, and this has kind of become a uh, proof in the pudding that a weight craniotomy is a, as a useful adjunct to improve uh, surgical resection and, and uh, optimize patient outcomes. Uh, and especially if you use it, uh, if you use it more than often, you know, this paper, uh, this, uh, uh, the rule rather than the exception, meaning that you should try to use an awake craniotomy as much as possible because A, it gets your anesthesiologist familiar with doing the surgery. Um, B, it improves your patient outcomes because you have a real-time exam that you're monitoring and it's not affected by the anesthesia. And you can maximize your surgical resection. Um, and, you know, I think Hugh Defoe has kind of, um, kind of demonstrated that to us uh, when he kind of came over here and talked. Um, uh, and then, you know, this is, this is a, this is a glioma in the, near the motor strip demonstrating, you know, you know, demonstrating you can get a good resection, you know, with awake mapping of these tumors without any residual. And this is a, this is a GBM that we were operating on about three years ago and the patient's still, uh, still alive, um, uh, uh, with that. Um, so for tumors that are deep and accessible tumors that are hard to get to, uh, in a, you know, in deep critical areas, um, there's a variety of different options we've kind of uh, looked into. Um, we've all talked about the brain retractor systems in terms of Vicor and brain path and their utility in resecting these deep lesions. Um, you know, uh, Dan uh, has been uh, really good about publishing our multi-institutional case series with uh, people from Mayo and Johns Hopkins, um, looking at uh, different pathologies and the utility of these uh, retractor systems for resecting these lesions. Um, and uh, we've demonstrated that, you know, these tubular tractors are very useful for resection of colloid cysts. This is quite controversial um, in certain circles of using these tubular tractors uh, to go transcortically and resect uh, these lesions. But this is a case we did about two weeks ago uh, using a translocal approach to resect this lesion. Um, uh, you know, it had a gross total resection. Uh, some of the capsule were very stuck to the veins. So we left that, uh, left a small amount of capsule on the veins and the patient left uh, the next day. Um, this gives you a rapid access for uh, these tumors with minimal trauma to the outside brain if you use a transocal approach. And, uh, you know, this is a, this is a great, uh, great opportunity to use tubular retractors. Um, this is another one of a atrial meningioma um, done, I think, a few, I think a few months ago um, using, uh, uh, using uh, this kind of Vicor system for resection of these uh, deep-seated lesions uh, in the ventricle uh, without minimal with minimal transgression through the cortex. Um, well, what if what if uh, what if these lesions are not accessible, uh, or there's not a good sulci to go through, or there's uh, or they're near you know uh, near the thalamus or um, or basal ganglia. Um, you know, laser interstitial th thermal therapy has kind of been developed over the last five to seven years. And I think our institution is probably one of the leaders in this field. Um, and laser sounds great. It sounds great. Everybody's, everybody can say, oh, you know, oh, you have the laser, but, you know, you know, that you, you're ablating these tumors. But, you know, the question is, does it work? Um, 
And I think the sheer amount of data that we've published in lasers is kind of unparalleled in the country. Um, and uh, a lot of that, you know, is due to the fact that we have such a high volume here um, and that we see a large, uh, uh, um, a, lo a lot of different pathologies um, uh, using lit for uh, different types of tumors. Um, this is the largest series that's been published on lit uh, to date. Uh, this is a hundred different patients. Um, uh, I lit for tumors. I, 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 I'm not, this is not lit for epilepsy. So, so, uh, um, um, but this is a, one of the largest series for lit for tumors. Um, and that, uh, this is a paper demonstrating that overall survival and newly diagnosed GBM was greater than 24 months, uh, using lit for these kind of deep seated, uh, eloquent region gliomas. Um, and then, but not only that, it's also efficient, uh, effective for a lot of different tumors, for, including metastasis, um, you know, radiation necrosis, recurrent GBM as well. Um, and this is kind of the, um, these percent of ablation for uh, laser for these different types of pathologies. We looked at these individually to see whether or not, uh, you know, the survival for these patients uh, is uh, is improved with lit or not. And we demonstrated that um, the extent of ablation uh, correlated to improved survival. Um, we did some meta-analyses in these patients and uh, demonstrated that, you know, the lit actually induces an immune response in these patients and that's immune response correlates to an improved survival. So Javier actually looked at this new um, metric called the... Um, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, demonstrating that if you had a, a greater neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, the your survival was improved in patients uh, undergoing lit. So this is a kind of a biomarker uh, to prognosticate patients um, uh, after lit as well. Um, Evan uh, uh, also looked at this as well for radiation necrosis, demonstrating that if you did a super total uh, ablation of radiation necrosis, of this is this is all biopsy proven, histologically proven radiation necrosis, that you'd actually get uh, improved progression free survival uh, and uh, and reduction in steroid dependence uh, in these patients as well. And this has been demonstrated in a lot of different other studies as well. Um, and, you know, the lid is also useful for deep cerebral metastasis that have failed radiation therapy as well. So we use it quite often for these patients. Uh, we did one yesterday on a, on a small cell lung, non-small cell lung cancer uh, patient who had a recurrence of a disease as well. Um, uh, and, uh, but, you know, you have to be honest with yourselves if your results don't necessarily work. So, you know, I, I will say first and foremost that this is, you know, lid is very helpful for metastasis, for radiation necrosis, for gliomas. But for drill-based lesions, uh, its utility is, you know, a little bit uh, has yet to be developed um, because, uh, you know, this is a very small study of uh, some six or seven patients that we've looked at for drill-based lesions, and the recurrence rate was quite high. It's, you know, about 40% 40, 40 or so. So, you know, lit for drill-based lesions still leaves something to be desired, but it's still something we can work on, you know, in the future. Um, of course, any type of use of lit or any of these stereotactic biopsy uh, techniques requires, uh, um, you know, robust neuro navigation. Uh, we're blessed at UM to have the ROSA robot and the O-arm to kind of confirm your trajectories, confirm where your biopsy needle is so that it reduces your inaccuracies and you have confirmation of exactly where you are uh, when your needle goes in. Um, and this is added to a lot of safety, prevented a lot of take backs for biopsies, and uh, um, I think has uh, given us uh, you know, kind of a, you know, new armamentarium for treating patients as well. Um, so that's all great. You know, you treated the patient, you've done surgery, you've did a preoperative planning, but, you know, we all know that most accidents happen within five minutes of home. And, you know, uh, we've kind of looked at, you know, different, uh, different areas and avenues for improving closure techniques. Um, Dan is the kind of king of amnion. He's kind of looked at whether or not amnions reduced, you know, CSF leaks, uh, after surgery. Um, uh, uh, and his data suggested that, you know, pseudomeningocele rates using amnion, uh, re is reduced uh, significantly. Um, we've looked at the use of lumbar drains in patients who have these pseudotumor like conditions and the utility of that to prevent CSF leaks and wound dehiscence. Um, and beyond that, you know, we've kind of taken a page from Dr. Wang's book about enhanced recovery after anesthesia. Uh, we know that um, this is really important in spine patients and, and in general surgery patients, but the idea hasn't really been implemented in cranial surgery that well. Um, and thanks to help with Damien and Angela, uh, we've kind of looked at uh, predictors of successful discharge in post operative day one patients and kind of an ERAS protocol for cranial patients. This involves a lot of different things, but, you know, basically post op day zero and post op day one physical therapy, uh, no narcotics, um, uh, MRI early as possible to get them out of bed so you can have an idea of what the tumor bed looks like. Um, these hair sparing techniques, you know, add a little bit for this kind of psychological idea that you've act, you haven't, you know, 
you haven't, you know, harmed the patient, you haven't shaved a lot of ha hair. So the patients feel like they're, you know, kind of at their, you know, preoperative baseline. And you follow up uh, with them at home with phone calls at home to kind of ensure that they're doing okay. Um, this, you know, the hair sparing technique is, uh, you know, is a great technique uh, for certain patients. It's very painful for the residents because hair, you know, routinely enters the field and it, you know, it's, it, it gets kind of painful, but, you know, for the attendings, it's really nice. And for the patients, they love it because they don't have an incision. They don't have sutures they can take out and they go home the next day without any issues. Um, so this is a, you know, this is kind of popularized by Simon and a few others, um, but this intradermal technique, intradermal technique is, uh, is, is widely popular now. Um, beyond this is kind of very interesting stuff that's coming out in the next uh, few months, but uh, we've now looked with COVID and the idea of outpatient brain tumor surgery. Um, so the idea of discharging patients immediately, uh, you know, s several hours after your initial surgery, and this is the kind of treatment paradigm we've highlighted for um, outpatient surgery, uh, uh, out outpatient brain tumor surgery. I mean, this has been described before in Toronto um, and in Canada for uh, other types of brain tumors, but we're kind of, um, you know, I'm going to say reinventing the wheel a little bit here in Miami and trying to, uh, you know, and publishing our initial series of 25 patients and, uh, and markers for success. So we're learning, this is kind of a learning curve that we're learning as we're going uh, with this outpatient uh, brain tumor paradigm. Um, of course, this, you know, of course you can't do any type of neuro-oncology without good pathology. And we're kind of lucky here at UM that we've got Dr. Gultikin and Dr. Saad, who are, you know, excellent neuropathologists who have helped us out with um, these uh, tissue diagnoses. Um, and, uh, you know, we're fortunate that we were able to trial the Raman histology system um, that kind of optimized uh, efficiency for um, brain tumor diagnoses. We reduced um, the, uh, you know, frozen diagnosis time by 30 minutes using this technique, and the accuracy was still maintained. Um, uh, you can see that, you know, you can even add in artificial intelligence for this system and, and, and differentiate areas of normal brain and tumor. Um, uh, using this, uh, using this technique. And this is, you know, some pretty interesting work that was done by our uh, colleagues in Michigan, um, um, Dan Oranger and um, uh, Todd Holland kind of looking at, uh, 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 you know, whether or not this is a useful technique for uh, uh, intraoperative diagnoses. Um, at UM, we kind of looked at, you know, different areas of the tumor and demonstrated that, you know, as you extend beyond the area of conscious enhancement, Raman histology is able to diagnose glioma infiltration beyond the conscious enhan enhancing boundary. And this is kind of uh, some interesting work that, you know, can really be uh, used for, you know, maybe potential guided surgical resection. Um, you know, it's useful not only for gliomas, but a variety of other pathologies. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's kind of the next future uh, of uh, in, in the, you know, the next step in neurosurgery is basically using these techniques to improve our path pathology and give us a rapid idea of whether or not we've had a gross total resection in the OR and whether or not we can expand um, our margins of resection. Um, beyond, uh, you know, surgery, obviously, you know, radio surgery uh, and hope and radiation therapy uh, give you local, improve local control after, after surgical resection. And, you know, um, we're lucky and fortunate we have good radiation oncologists that are able to get our patients in pretty quickly after, after surgical resection. Uh, and we've demonstrated that, you know, after, after surgery, uh, you know, radio surgery is able to provide uh, local, improve local control in these patients. Um, and that uh, you're able to get uh, good results uh, um, with early radiation therapy. Um, you know, atypical anaplastic meningiomas are difficult tumors in general because they tend to recur and they tend to grow aggressively. Uh, so, you know, we, we know that we need to be very vigilant with these patients and we have a, um, a paradigm to basically treat all the patients with adjuvant radiation therapy uh, after gross total resection for these atypicals. I mean, this is not standard of care, but it's currently the subject of a clinical trial, but you know, our data has suggested that um, local control is markedly improved uh, after giving adjuvant radiation therapy um, after gross total resection of these lesions. And this has been demonstrated in several different studies. And uh, I think we're going to find out the next uh, year or so um, on the preliminary results of the, uh, the multi-center clinical trial from the RTOG. Um, not only, not only do you, you use radiation therapy, but there are different methods to actually uh, improve and potentiate radiation therapy. This is some basic science work that Sumed did as a medical student with the Regina Graham, uh, um, showing that you can potentiate radiation therapy um, uh, with 2-deoxy-D-glucose uh, two, 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 two as well. 
but you know, radiation isn't always good. And we know that there are complications of radiation uh, that we need to know about. Um, and we need, to, we need to be able to manage as neurosurgeons. Um, and uh, this is a 50 year old male who came in with non-small cell lung cancer, uh, status post gamma knife a year ago, who had this lesion that's progressively getting worse with worsening edema and symptoms. Um, so then you ask yourself, well, what are my options for treatment, treating this patient? Um, uh, the patient comes in, went to their outside neuro, neuro, uh, neuro-oncologist. Uh, he started the patient on steroids. The patient was on steroids for several weeks. Uh, was getting symptomatic from these steroids. Um, got, a, got a GI ulcer. And uh, so then you're left with the next question. So what are options? You can use a Vastin, which is an IV drug. You have to use it for about six weeks for treatment of these lesions. You can use LIT, um, but LIT for this lesion is kind of quite large. Or you can use, uh, or you can, you know, go and remove it. Um, so, you know, we've demonstrated that, you know, salvage craniotomy for treatment refractory radiation necrosis is a, is a good option for certain patients. And that if they are truly treatment refractory, meaning that they fail steroids or are steroid dependent, uh, surgery can get these patients off of steroids quickly and you get rapid diagnosis, uh, for these patients. So this is a, is some interesting work that was published in neuro-oncology practice, um, you know, looking at craniotomy for radiation necrosis. And interestingly, there's not a lot of papers on this subject. So this is, if any residents are interested in looking at radiation necrosis and kind of their, um, transcriptomic profile, this is a interesting avenue, uh, and certainly, uh, so, somewhere we can get a lot of tissue since we do so many of these surgeries. Um, beyond radiation oncology, uh, you know, the idea of improving chemotherapy and improving other adjuvant modalities is very important. Uh, the STU protocol was done in 2005, you know, outcomes remain pretty poor despite adjuvant chemo radiation. So, you know, the idea of moving away from systemic chemotherapy to local chemotherapy has been explored. Uh, we've kind of looked at that ourselves at Miami, looking at gliadel, intra-arterial chemotherapy brachytherapy, and these are all kind of systematic reviews uh, assessing whether or not these were effective, you know, uh, treatment options for uh, these patients and what their complication profile was. Um, um, we've even looked in preclinical models of natural therapy, such as curcumin. This is some work put done by Regina Graham looking at the curcumin to basically a target uh, glioma, glioblastoma stem cells. And uh, this is some interesting work demonstrating that curcumin is an active, is a very potential, uh, potentially good treatment modality for uh, patients. And and luckily, it's FDA approved, so it's certainly something to be looked at in the future. Beyond that, um, I think a lot of people don't know that Miami is a center, as uh, a as a very big tumor epigenetics program, and something that we can leverage a lot here at UM. Um, uh, both Dr. De La Fuente, Dr. Ayad have uh, basically labs focusing on tumor epigenetics in glioma, and uh, this is the focus of, of some clinical trials as well. Um, so as everyone knows, IDH mutant gliomas are a very, uh, unique subtype of glioblastoma. They have an interesting subtype since they are hypermethylated and they have a lot of epigenetic changes that can be targeted. So these are, these are the kind of the ideal, uh, group of patients that could be treated with epigenetic therapy. Um, here at Miami, we were actually fortunate to have, uh, um, early clinical trials looking at IDH1 inhibitors. Um, these are not really on the market yet, uh, but they're, you know, uh, the subject of different clinical trials. And Dr. Delafonte looked at using uh, avocidinib, which is a uh, selective IDH1 inhibitor for, uh, glioblast, uh, for IDH mutant glioblastoma. Uh, this is a patient that, was, that initially underwent uh, laser dermal therapy, had ablation of this lesion here, and was then treated with uh, avocidinib and had very good uh, um, results from uh, this, uh, this treatment. Um, and has basically been um, lesion free for uh, several years after treatment. Um, and this is demonstrated in other uh, studies as well. Um, we're writing a systematic review looking at the use of epigenetic therapies um, in GBM as well. And we've demonstrated that, um, you know, in, in this in select patients, uh, uh, outcomes can be uh, quite improved uh, using these epigenetic treatment uh, options. Um, uh, beyond that, you know, bromodomain inhibitors uh, and uh, non-coding RNAs can be used as serum markers as well for these patients. So another use for potential epigenetics uh, is as biomarkers. And this is a paper that was published in Molecular Cancer demonstrating that uh, RNA uh, long-coding, non-coding non, non uh, long RNAs could be used uh, uh, as a, basically a biomarker in certain patients of, of disease. Um, 
So, you know, we've kind of gone over targeted drugs such as epigenetic therapy. We've gone over chemotherapy and radiation. Um, the next, you know, avenue that everybody, that any major tumor center has is immunotherapy and viral therapy. And I think, uh, you know, Miami is certainly a, a good center for that as well. Um, you know, we've demonstrated that immunotherapy uh, the therapeutic options for GBM are uh, are very promising. This is a review of all different clinical trials looking at the ginger, dendritic cell uh, therapies um, for GBM, uh, showing that their uh, overall survival is improved compared to controls. Um, we have our own clinical trial that was uh, started here at UM by Dr. Goldberg and is now being um, finished up here with Dr. De La Fuente, but uh, using a dendritic cell vaccine for recurrent high-grade gliomas. This is the protocol that was published in the Red Journal, and uh, this is the um, abstract that's going to um, that was published in Neuro Oncology, um, basically demonstrating that uh, you know some uh, improved outcomes for these patients uh, who uh, were treated with dendritic cell vaccines uh, for recurrent high grade glioma. So this publication is coming out soon, and we'll you know we're looking forward to seeing that as well. Um, Yet, you know, it's not all roses and butter, you know, not all roses and butterflies here. Uh, you know, we know that immunotherapy and GBM has not worked uh, in several different clinical trials. The, the Checkmate 143 trial using um, nivolumab for GBM was would de demonstrate disappointing results and the patient's survival was no better than, than standard of care. Um, so we know that, you know, there's a lot to be uh, improved here in immunotherapy for GBM. Um, and so that kind of transitions to the, our, you know, our experience here in Miami using viral based therapeutics. Um, we've looked at uh, the, the outcomes of patients who uh, underwent viral, um, you know, viral oncolytic therapy or viral gene therapy for GBM. And uh, we've kind of looked at that and looked at the uh, number of trials and their overall survival um, in several different studies. Um, this is one uh, published last month by Dr. Liu, uh, looking at you know, overall survival in this um, uh, in these cohorts of patients. Uh, here in Miami, we we're fortunate to basically be able to trial um, uh, one, uh, replicating retroviral vector, uh, TOCA 511. Uh, our early stage uh, clinical trial results demonstrated that we were able to get good tumor infiltration with this therapy and uh, adjuvant uh, um, uh, immune reactivation as well. Um, the initial phase one clinical trial using uh, TOCO 501 demonstrates some improved uh, results, but the phase three data uh, did not demonstrate any improvement in survival. Um, so this was kind of a, you know, kind of disappointing for everybody here at Miami and of course uh, the TOCO 501 company. Um, but, uh, you know, when you look at, you know, the subgroup analysis, there's a subgroup of patients that actually benefited from, uh, from this therapy. And this was the IDH mutant patients that actually, uh, had um, uh, improved overall survival, um, uh, compared to patients who had, uh, IDH wild type. So, um, so, you know, as always, it's always important to subgroup these patients. Um, we developed our own novel, a ret replicating retroviral vector, um, labeled RV NTR using nitro reductase. And we demonstrated that this therapy uh, is very useful for different uh, glioma cell lines for rat and mice glioma cell lines. It even works in, uh, in human glioma cell lines as well. This is a, a tumor tissue taken from a patient who was enrolled in a clinical trial. Um, uh, and uh, we basically grew out their patient derived glioma cell lines, marked them, uh, grew them in mice and treated them uh, with uh, the replicating retroviral vector and uh, demonstrated that, you know, each area of the tumor had a differential response to this, ther to this therapy, which kind of gives the idea that each tumor that uh, has this kind of intratumoral heterogeneity and, you know, viral therapies aren't going to be the end all be all for these patients because, you know, even within this tumor, you know, the viral therapy has, you know, mixed effects. So, uh, you know, it's important to note that when you're, you know, when you're treating these patients and you're dying and you're, you know, signing them up for surgery is that, you know, there is variable, um, tumor response rates to viral therapy and each, you know, subset of tumors may respond differently uh, to your therapeutic. And this has been demonstrated by, you know, Dr. Chioka and Dr. Um, Lang as well from MD Anderson. So, um, you know, I think this is kind of, these are important, you know, nuances to know. And whenever you're thinking about viral therapy. Um, so I'm moving kind of fast. So I kind of, you know, uh, you know, stop me if you have any questions, but uh, I kind of wanted to go over some big data in GBM and kind of how you can, uh, you know, leverage this big data for, uh, for patient outcomes. Um, 
Uh, so there's two types of big data. One is the clinical data, which exists in several different databases, uh, including the national inpatient sample and the cancer database. Um, Evan Luther is kind of a wizard in the national inpatient sample uh, database. He's demonstrated that, you know, large volume academic centers have better results for glioma surgery and tumor surgery in general. Uh, meaning that these patients uh, tend to have less complications and uh, and uh, less mortality compared to patients who have compared to centers who have a, a lower uh, caseload. So um, this is a very interesting study published in Journal of Neuro-Oncology. Um, uh, Victor Luz looked at uh, disparities uh, in access to care uh, for Hispanic patients in the United States and demonstrating that certain areas of the globe, certain areas of the United States actually have worse access for triple therapy uh, um, uh, for GBM. So this is, you know, important to note because these are the areas where you want to focus, uh, you know, basically these public health uh, initiatives to improve access to care for these patients. Um, beyond just the clinical data, there's a huge repository of omics-based uh, data sets uh, that exist. And I think a lot of us as neurosurgeons aren't really familiar with this. So the TCGA is a huge bio, uh, bio data set, including, you know, about 560 GBM samples and about you know, 300 low-grade glioma samples that we can leverage and use their transcriptomic profiles there to kind of uh, see whether or not, uh, you know, treatment, uh, treatment, um, different treatments work or not. Uh, the LINCS data sets another interesting one that's been, uh, been published by the NIH and is uh, available to us easily online. Uh, and you can use these data sets to develop, to determine the disease signature of your patient and target different chemo, different chemotherapeutics uh, that will reverse that disease signature, meaning that if you have X, Y, or Z uh, genes that are upregulated in a tumor, different drugs will basically downregulate those same genes. And you'll know based on these, based using these links, this links omics profile, which compounds will work for the, for that given disease. Uh, and you can even just go online right now and type in your, your gene expression profile for your patient or for your disease. And it will give you a list of the top drugs, which will reverse that gene expression signature. So we've looked at whether or not this reversal of gene expression correlates to drug efficacy. And we're demonstrating in GBM and in every single subtype of GBM that you're able to demonstrate a correlation between the reversal of gene expression and the efficacy of different FDA approved drugs. Um, this is work that's uh, gonna hopefully be submitted in the next week or so, but uh, basically this work kind of leveraged a lot of the work from you know these big databases such as Kemble, the Lynx profile, uh, the cancer cell line encyclopedia, uh, and a lot of different uh, other data sets. So, um, uh, you know, this is this has uh, been done before. Uh, you know, Dr. Ayaz Lab published their uh, uh, work using a kind of a synergy platform to see whether or not two drugs would reverse the disease signature even more than a single drug. And this was published in Nature Communications. Um, obviously, if you have any type of, you know, um, any type of, uh, you know, preclinical data or in silico data, you have to couple that with, you know, some sort of model. Um, you know, Dr. Ivan's lab is working on modeling these tumors uh, with organoids uh, currently, uh, and uh, they're demonstrating that you, this kind of recapitulates the tumor and kind of gives you a, you know, uh, a nice model that's not quite an animal model, but uh, it's much better than in vitro results. And, uh, and this kind of helps you, you um, helps, you know, see whether or not uh, these kind of therapeutics could work, uh, you know, in a, in a model system. Uh, and this is kind of gives us the ultimate paradigm from basically bedside where you culture the patient, uh, derive patient samples, um, bring it to the bench, see whether or not they work in these organoid models, see whether they work um, based on the reversal of gene expression signature, and then you bring it back to the bedside with these kind of personalized clinical trials. And I think we're just on the cusp of kind of this personalized treatment approach for these patients. And I think that, you know, there's only, you know, only a few more years before we kind of come up with a kind of personalized treatment paradigm for these patients and, uh, you know, give our recurrent GBM patients a kind of an omics based, uh, you know, treatment approach. And I think that that's the next step in GBM. And I think we're, we're pretty close to it. Um, you know, beyond the research, you know, the, the UMBTI growth has, you know, markedly increased over the last several years. You can see the uh, improvement in resident uh, productivity uh, since, you know, basically in, since the, you know, this is not obviously, you know, causative, but, you know, there's definitely an improvement in uh, resident academic productivity. The amount of clinical trials has markedly increased over the last several years. 
Um, the uh, number of publications, you know, from 1979 to 2010, you know, if you look up neurosurgery, brain tumor, University of Miami, you get like, you know, 21 publications. But, you know, when you look at, you know, look at it from the last 10 years, you know, there's about 180 publications. So, um, you know, I think this is, you know, has several, a lot of things to do with the fact that we're publishing more these days. But I think that the overall academics and the overall uh, uh, desire to, um, to, to publish and to improve our patient outcomes has markedly increased. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, that we've now have these, you know, global brain tumor symposiums that have been, uh, or have, give, have given us access to, you know, a lot of different leaders in the field who obviously give us knowledge and help us improve our patient outcomes as well. So having that platform to discuss our patients and discuss treatment modalities is, is huge. And I, I've learned a lot from these symposiums uh, myself. Uh, obviously, you know, future directions for these, uh, for, uh, you know, for these, for the brain tumor, you know, kind of paradigms, um, obviously, uh, we're still a brain tumor initiative, uh, you know, and uh, it would be nice to develop a brain tumor institute, obviously, with funding uh, from donors. Um, you know, you know, ideally, uh, in the next several years, we hope to get a spore grant. I mean, every big brain tumor center in the country, um, you know, I think they have uh, four or five of them have spore grants. Um, and I think this is, you know, uh, you know, something that we have our eyes on as well. Um, obviously, the expansion of surgeon uh, clinical trials is very important. Um, and that, you know, every single patient you know, that comes in with a recurrent GBM should be enrolled in a clinical trial to, to hopefully optimize outcomes, because we know that recurrent GBM outcomes are extremely poor. So, um, you know, any opportunity to improve these patient outcomes uh, would be warranted. Um, and of course, you know, you know, I think that standardization, standardization of tissue collection is important. And I think luckily with Sylvester's help, we we're able to standardize tissue collection and improve um, basically the uh, kind of operative, uh, the paradigm for, um, you know, collecting this tissue and sequencing this tissue. Uh, we're actually going to send a lot of our tissue to uh, New York to get them you know, basically all sequenced as well. Uh, and I think that's the kind of next step is, you know, these kind of big, um, big data and GBM and, you know, kind of leveraging a lot of that work. Uh, I kind of went through a whirlwind of a talk, you know, and, you know, went through about 130 slides there. Um, so if you have any questions, please let me know. There's a lot of people that have helped out with this work. And I, I think, you know, my mentors, Dr. Ivan, Dr. Komatar, you know, Dr. Levy, um, obviously uh, everybody for, you know, supporting this work and getting uh, all this done over the last 10 years. And, you know, it's a big, uh, big, uh, big task. I think we have a lot more to come. Fantastic work, Ashish. Congratulations to you for presenting that in, in 48 minutes and, <laughs> and also everybody who's uh, listed on the slide. I, I had two questions. Like one is what was the impact of the uh, pandemic on both uh, clinical, particularly the clinical trial work and the basic science work? I know in the, you know, with our Miami project trials that we definitely took a hit. Uh, in terms of recruitment and follow-up, uh, you know, we we have governmental grants that we've asked for extensions on because of it. Um, and so, what is a specific, you know, what has been the impact of COVID over the last thirteen months on these? Yeah, I mean, um, from the from the basically from the clinical research perspective, as you know, like you know, like you know, I basically started doing a lot of in silico work using like basically these, you know, this a lot of the data I can use basically from a computer where you can use these big uh, these big data sets and and looking at that work. But I think from clinical trial uh, recruitment, uh, I, I I guess I can defer Dr. Ivan if he's on. I know that they've you know I don't know if they've had some issues with uh, recruitment uh, with COVID nineteen. Yeah, it's been it's been down. I mean, we, we were still able to meet the recruitment for a goal that we had for last year for 2020, but it was definitely not where we expected it was going to be. Um, and then also the number of trials that we had open last year also took a took kind of a hit. Normally we have around 11 to 12 open over the last kind of three or four years. And last year we went down to only five to seven clinical trials open just because of the support from companies. And the second question or comment is that, you know, I think you, you did a, a fantastic job describing the, the, you know, the depth and breadth of research. Uh, and, I, and I think everybody kind of knows what the UMBTI is to a certain degree, um, you know, who the players and locations are. I think, you know, one of the things that would be good to do is sort of incorporate Jackson more in that picture. And, and, and I tell you, in the last six months, and particularly in the last month or two, there's been a definite synergy between 
Jackson and UM in, in collaboration. Uh, you, you know, they really want to ramp up the ability to do clinical trials at Jackson and make it more seamless. Uh, I mean, uh, just a perfect example of what's going on is that, you know, Stuart Miller uh, donated $10 million to Jackson to uh, help rename the ICU towers uh, uh, after his family. I mean, uh -huh. there's, there's just a lot of things that are happening synergistically. We, we, we hope that and, and plan to, to do neurosurgery co-branding uh, that is both Jackson and UM together. Uh, and so I think that this, this is definitely an opportunity because clearly, you know, brain tumor surgery gets done at UM hospital, but it also, there's a lot of stuff that gets done at Jackson as well. So, um, it, you know, I think that will be uh, some, some, a goal uh, for the future. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, uh, the, uh, a big, a big, uh, it would be really nice to basically get the Sylvester bio repository to basically collect brain tumor samples from Jackson if possible, because I mean, they come to UMH and they consent to the patients there. Um, and if we can get the tumor samples from Jackson, that'd be a huge benefit as well, because there's, you know, so much pathology that we see over there as well. And I think that'd be really nice uh, and incorporating a lot of these clinical trials as well over there. Hey, Ashish, I was just going to say that was an amazing talk. Uh, I'm not sure how you fit that into one hour, but it was pretty impressive. Um, I also wanted to emphasize, obviously, just like Alan said, this is not done uh, just in isolation. It's, there's such a high level of collaboration that needs to happen to have a center of excellence. Uh, just to mention a few, you know, you know, obviously neurology, neuro-oncology, rat on path, the cancer center, you know, everyone's been critical towards building that, that center of excellence and seeing this talk and seeing kind of how far it's come in just, in just 10 years really makes me proud to see all the, all the teamwork here at Miami. It's a very special place compared to others. Okay, so I thought I'll talk to you today about the latest work uh, that our team has done on bypass for Moya Moya and steno occlusive disease uh, looking at my experience for about 21 years. Um, I've, uh, the irrelevant disclosures, um, and we're submitting this work for publication. I've invited our colleagues from Stroke Neurology to join us, and of course they'll be uh, co-authors on this publication, but I would particularly like to thank Nick Khan, my tireless fellow, with the help of Turkey, Arya, Victor, Michael, previous work from Angela, as well as uh, the contribution to the, of the patients by our hematologist, Tom Harrington, and of course, Nelly Campo, who does the TCD work for VMR for us, Tatiana, our, my former, uh, when she was a nurse, uh, now nurse practitioner, of course, the group of stroke neurologists uh, for the clinical material. Um, so what was the objective is to analyze bypass surgery for Moya Moya disease, Moya Moya syndrome and steno occlusive disease, validate the use of the direct ECIC bypass. And the topic I'm really interested in is to evaluate the predictive power of intraoperative, this is a typo, intraoperative flow measurement, meaning cut flow, cut flow index, all those numbers that we obtain during surgery. Evaluate long-term bypass patency, clinical and angiographic outcomes. This is IRB approved, look at 21 years, uh, all my surgical cases and excluded bypass for aneurysms and tumors. Now, when we do direct bypasses, there are three types of anastomosis that I've used over the years, and I've labeled them one donor, one recipient, one donor, two recipients, or two donor, two recipient bypass. I'll be showing you examples of that later. Uh, this is kind of the classic linear incision over the craniotomy site after identifying the parietal branch of the STA, which is the most common uh, construct. Uh, notice in this particular schema, the anterior branch of the STA is preserved. And that's what the one, do, one donor, two recipient uh, technique does. You, you preserve the anterior branch. So what is your typical 
uh, at least successful case. Well, I'll start uh, an example with this one. She's 32 year old, uh, uh, African American nurse, uh, actually who works in a stroke unit. She had an episode of right arm heaviness, 20 minutes. She has an old right anterior frontal infarct. Uh, and uh, she had treated hyperthyroidism, unremarkable exam at the time. And that's your classic angiogram of Moya Moya uh, disease uh, with the steno occlusion at the top of the ICA bifurcation. Um, and this is an attempt at collateralization to the MCA via the posterior lateral choroidal the, to the anterior choroidal and via the PCA to the ACA and MCA. And that's uh, external carotid shot. And uh, this is uh, VMR, vasomotor reactivity, as measured here in our uh, in the neurology uh, lab uh, with uh, by transcranial Doppler. And I'll come back to that in a second with the reference ranges. But this is very low on the right hemisphere, 27 percent; left hemisphere, 32 percent. Uh, at the time, we were doing SPECT with Diamox. <coughs> We've changed over the years, but the SPECT with Diamox also showed hypoperfusion. So this is a classic uh, left STA-MCA setup, uh, uh, Dopplering the artery, dissecting them, uh, doing a craniotomy centered six centimeter above the external ear canal so that you catch the distal sylvian fissure identify the recipient, measuring the flow uh, in this recipient. For example, in this one, uh, frontal M4, it is 3.1 cc per minute using this transonic flow probe or the Charbel flow probe. Uh, you can, if you don't have it, you can certainly do it manually uh, by uh, bleeding the artery for about 15 seconds or so, and then multiply the volume by four. Um, I used to do that to validate uh, the, the, the transonic flow probe, but it's fairly accurate. I don't do it anymore. Um, you do your anastomosis. Uh, we can do it running. We can do it uh, interrupted, uh, depending how small the recipient is. Uh, make some measurements. Remeasure after you've done the anastomosis. This is now the bypass flow. Uh, remember the cut flow, the cut, the free bleeding STA was 60. Now it is 64 cc. What does that tell us? It tells us the brain was so hungry for extra perfusion, it really took everything given to it. It took the entire STA flow. Uh, so you divide the final bypass flow by the cut flow. That's based on Charbel's work. And that's the so-called CFI, cut flow index. Uh, I'll come back to that again later with the analysis of the data, but uh, Charbel's publications uh, suggested that a CFI of more than 50% um, predicts long-term patency of the bypass and CFI less than 50% pred predicts more likelihood to occlude asymptomatically in general, but to occlude in a delayed manner, meaning months and years later. So I want you to remember that those findings from the U, uh, he, he's a chairman at UIC from the UIC series when, when we compare our series here in a few minutes. Uh, this is, uh, these are the numbers of the left bypass on this uh, patient and a few weeks later. So this is, po I'm sorry, this is post-op CTA of the left side, uh, a patent bypass. She did well. I brought her a few weeks later and did the other side. And that's, a, that's when I usually do the angiogram after I've done both sides to, so we don't put them through too many procedures unnecessarily. So that's the right side patent. That's the left side patent. And she's done very well. I followed her more than 12 years now. I've actually operated on her mother as well. Uh, uh, Steno-occlusive disease. Moya Moya is fairly straightforward as an indication. Steno-occlusive disease remains more controversial. I've talked to you before in previous grand rounds on uh, the cost study and stuff. I'm not going to go over that. But uh, the typical select, selected patients who is successful 
with bypass for uh, atherosclerotic disease is, is, for example, a patient like this. He's 70, he was 76 at the time. Look at his watershed in far. He was having daily TIAs of that hemisphere with stage two uh, ischemia. He has an occluded cervical carotid. Uh, he has no ACOM crossover from the left side. Uh, poor collaterals from the posterior circulation. And his SPECT scan with diam uh, without Diamox and with Diamox shows you the classic uh, misery perfusion uh, because of a paradoxical drop in perfusion in that right hemisphere as it is being stolen from the normal left, as the blood flow is being stolen. So it's a steal from the normal, hemi uh, uh, from the normal hemisphere. So, uh, of course, that's a classic case. It, not every patient needs to be as, uh, as obvious as this. And as a matter of fact, uh, giving Diamox to very brittle patients uh, who are at the edge of stroking is a bad idea. So uh, it's, you should only do it when you have questions about the diagnosis. And then again, the vasomotor reactivity study measured uh, by our neurology group uh, is very low, 19% in that right hemisphere, and it's normal, 55% in the left hemisphere. So I proceeded with a bypass. This is I did a, this is what's called a 1D, 1R, one donor, one recipient. Um, and here is a completed bypass. Here is a post-op CTA. And this patient has not had a single TIA for 10 years and died of uh, an MI 10 years later. So what did we do in our study? Uh, and uh, we did it, of course, with the idea that we wanted to compare and contrast with other published literature. So angiographic analysis, preoperatively, we looked at severity of disease. Is it moderate? Is it severe? or is the vessel occluded? That's how we categorized the recipient uh, arteries. Uh, we looked at, in the angiographic analysis, what is there a good donor? Uh, the important concept that actually Nick Khan, my fellow, brought with him from Memphis, uh, he told me they were doing some work on looking at the degree of collateralization, whether it was compensated or not. And if uh, and then they factored that into a, a, a different study they were working on. So we thought, let's incorporate this analysis into this series. So then when you talk about collateralization, there are essentially three sources besides it being compensated or not. And I'll show you examples of what that is meant to be to mean is the collateralization coming from the ECA transdural. Is it leptomeningeal or PLPL or via the PCOM from the posterior circulation, vertebrobasal, or is it coming from contralateral ICA via the ACOM? So then uh, that, those are the three examples I just showed you, three different cases. You can see top left transdural collaterals, top right retrograde flow via the PCOM, and, and the bottom is uh, cross flow via the ACOM. Uh, so when looking at whether there is an area of compensated or uncompensated hypoperfusion, what is done, essentially, you have to overlap the different injections and figure out if you end up with an area, a bare area that's not receiving any blood supply. So you take this a case, for example, you overlap this posterior injection, uh, you overlap the transdural, and you see that there is a large area of uh, of uh, uh, area of perfusion without compensation. So that would be categorized as uh, uh, uncompensated. Uh, <coughs> you do the same here, uh, and and, and the same principle. So what else did we look at in angiography? We looked at post-op uh, angiographic analysis. We what do we look at? Obviously. Uh, Again, this is a typo. I hate the autocorrect. Sometimes you, you correct it three times and it still gives you the wrong word. So I, I typed in bypass patency and it, I guess it keeps showing bypass latency. So I mean bypass patency. You look at the, uh, the published Matsushima grading. That's a degree of 
perfusion offered by the bypass or the indirect collaterals that grew after surgery. And Matsushima grades it uh, very simply into A, B, or C, whether two th more than two thirds of the MCA uh, territory is perfused, whether it's one third to two thirds, or whether it is less than one third. So this is a typical mature bypass, for example, three years uh, after surgery. You can see the STA, well, you don't know what it looked like before, but trust me, it was much smaller than this, but this is a much hypertrophied STA. Please notice how the anterior branch was not used in this case. We only use the posterior branch and it's, uh, it's taking over the almost the entire MCA distribution. On the other hand, this is one of the two cases in the among the 162 of the series that had an acute bypass acute bypass occlusion during their hospitalization. You can see here immediate post-op that the STA comes and stops right there. Uh, in this particular case, uh, I postulate that it was a very small recipient, so it is a technical problem with the bypass, the discrepancy between the STA and the recipient. So I took him straight back to surgery, revised it, shows a different recipient, and now this uh, bottom right shows a patent bypass after the revision. Uh, now, uh, I will come to that and tell you in a second how many bypasses have occluded in a delayed manner. But when they occlude, all of the ones that we have occluded in a delayed manner in this series were occluded completely asymptomatically. And the typical case is like this case. The anastomo, the bypass occludes uh, whenever time, a year, two, five years later, most of the time because indirect collaterals have taken over. So look at this very vigorous transdural collateralization from the anterior STA branch that was not used uh, for the bypass. And look at the mid capillary phase from this transdural. So it's quite, uh, it's not very fast flow, but it is quite large volume of uh, collateralization. Um, and th that's also from the work of Charbel. Sometimes the indirect uh, anastomoses make the direct anastomosis uh, regress slowly over time. We then looked at the TCDs, transcranial Doppler vasomotor reactivity, as is done in the neurology department, the neurology lab here at the University of Miami. They have a special way of doing it. It's inhaled CO2, which of course is a powerful vasodilator. We look at the they look at the percent change in MCA velocity in hypocapnia versus normal capnia versus hypercapnia. And uh, the, at least the standards or references are that a normal number, and the, the formula, of course, is you, I should have written the formula, but you take the velocity at uh, hypocapnia, at hypercapnia minus the velocity at hypocapnia divided by the velocity at normal capnia. So it gives you uh, uh, the, the, the degree of ability to autoregulate uh, with CO2. You want a number ideally more than 70% in each hemisphere, in each MCA territory. If it's 50 to 70, it's mildly impaired. 35 to 49 is moderately impaired and less than 35% in severely impaired. Uh, in COVID times, uh, Nelly Campo, who does uh, most of these studies, told me that uh, the, the way that VMR is done was not, uh, of course, safe to do. With, uh, so they, they resorted to breath holding index, which you can also get anyway. And how do you do that? You do transcranial Doppler of the MCA. The patient holds their breath for up to 30 seconds if they can, or any number of seconds they can you're measuring the TCD rise in velocity uh, in the MCA when they're doing that during this apnea. And then you divide that percentage increase by the number of seconds of apnea that they've done. And ideally in a normal uh, BHI should be more than 0.69. 
what else did we look at? Well, clinical and angiographic follow-up, these patients are seen at two weeks, six weeks, six months, one year, two years, and many years in an ideal setting. Of course, we don't have that on every single patient. And the post-op angiographic views are either CTA, MRA, or DSA. So what are the results? So there were 124 patients 162 procedures because of bilaterality of disease in 72 patients. What is our clinical follow-up? The mean is two years and 11 months. The range is from one day to 21 years uh, is the longest. And geographic follow-up mean of uh, one year and nine months, the range is from one day to 12 years and a bit. Uh, of course, over the years, uh, the referral base has uh, increased. So uh, looking at the 21 years into three different allotments of seven years each, I only did 14 surgeries of this type, uh, the first seven years, then 41, then 107. So patient information, what do the patients look like? So we divided the overall cohort if you want to look at the summary of the overall cohort, look only to the left column that says overall. If you want to see the breakdown into the three categories of disease, Moya Moya disease, Moya Moya syndrome, and steno-occlusive disease, then you have, we divided those into the three columns you can see. As expected, of course, the Moya Moya syndrome patients were the youngest. Uh, Moya, by the way, Moya Moya syndrome, meaning you have an identifiable cause, be it uh, previous radiation therapy, be it sickle cell disease, be it thyroid disorder, uh, be the tumor. Um, Moya Moya disease is the classic idiopathic one, and steno-occlusive disease is, of course, generally atherosclerotic disease. Those tend to be the uh, older and sicker, and you can see that in the mean ages. You can see the race breakdown, the hemispheres generally more common in the left, on the left side, probably because they tend to be more symptomatic. And like, like a classic North American series, ischemia rather than hemorrhage uh, was a predominant presentation, be it stroke or be it TIA. Uh, continuing the demographics, you can see the list of comorbidities in each of the group. And then you can see the MRS, modified Rankine score, preoperatively per hemisphere uh, in the patients. Uh, I wish we could get every single angiogram that was done, but it's a long-term study of retrospective for 21 years. It was impossible to identify every pre-op uh, imaging analysis. We went by reports in the ones we could not find, so we could found, find 51 a 56 percent uh, pre-op angio actually films to review re-review ourselves in the post-op we had cta uh, most commonly then dsa then mra uh, here is the angiographic analysis in for the moya moya cases we applied the suzuki grade and we were this was applicable in 71 hemispheres and you can see most of the cases uh, where middle range Suzuki, Suzuki three, there are 27 of those. The second uh, row you see there, th the concept we discussed is overall collateralization. It was incomplete in 69 and complete in 22. So remember those numbers. We'll come back to that in the results uh, analysis later. A type of collateralization, the most common was leptomeningeal. Most, uh, this most, most affected vessel, of course, was the ICA. The degree of stenosis was most, most of the time occluded vessel, most commonly. And post-operative Matsushima grade, the ABC I talked about, the most common result is, was an A, 33 of them. Uh, so that was a good uh, uh, perfusion post-op. Post-op bypass patency is 90% long term. So that's 140 patients out of the 162. 16 patients were documented occluded. 
So what does the VMR and BHI analysis show? The preoperatively, the preoperative, by the way, so the preop VMR was poor, the uh, meaning, I would like to think, meaning a proper selection of patients. It was a mean of 29%, uh, as I told you, the normal is 70% and higher. So the BHI was also poor preoperatively in uh, a mean of 0.52. Postoperatively, interestingly, as was shown in other cases, the VMRs and the BHIs don't change that much in spite of clinical improvement, in spite of uh, angiographic patency of bypasses. So in the 33 patients where we were able to identify pre-op and post-op VMR, they were 30% pre-op, 39% post-op. In the 19 patients that had BHI pre and post-op, it was 0.5% uh, and 0.5 pre-op, 0.53 post-op, not, not a big change. SPECT CTP analysis uh, is not as thorough as we would like it because again, we've changed, uh, I've changed using uh, the different studies over time, but preoperatively the SPECT was decreased perfusion in 41 of 46 cases, there was no decrease by SPECT in five uh, in the pre-op analysis. The CTP was decreased in 34 cases. Now, this is uh, the, the uh, intra-op, uh, uh, oh, I guess, I'm sorry, I showed you this slide already. Uh, here is the intra-op uh, analysis. Uh, this is the type of bypass. The most common bypass used was 1D, 1R. This is a so-called single barrel in 115 cases. 1D2R was the most recent variant. I've given you grand rounds on this two months ago on uh, the analysis of that subgroup of 1D2R. And then the 2D2R is a double barrel. The STA was the most common donor, but you can see that sometimes I had to use the occipital artery for posterior circulation or in one case, anterior circulation using the occipital artery. I had to use the posterior auricular artery in two cases when the STA was not adequate. And then where the recipient is, you can see the list of possible recipient, but of course the most common is an STA to the M4 uh, bypass. Uh, the type of suturing, I usually prefer continuous running suture unless the recipient artery is very small, in which case I will use interrupted sutures. And I oftentimes mix in one wall inter interrupted, one wall continuous, depending on the ergonomics of the given case. Here is an interesting actionable result, SSEP almost never changed. And essentially, I have no justification to keep using SSEP in these cases based on my data. It decreased only in one case temporarily, uh, increased in two, and the vast majority never changed. So this issue, the worry that people talk about, oh, temporary occlusion of the recipient artery, uh, it, it's not an issue. It is not an issue, at least the way the, we do it here. Now, I am very interested in measuring flow, as I showed you, the cut flow, meaning the, the flow that the STA can give, the range was from eight to 140 cc per minute, which is why I tell our residents and fellows, we should not use the term low flow bypass necessarily when we use the STA. It can be a huge flow from a so-called simple STA. Use the term low capacitance or low caliber bypass, but you, you have no idea what the flow is until you measure it. So the cut flow was 52 on average, uh, the, mean, the median, I'm sorry. The total final bypass flow after the anastomosis is done was 44 median. And that gives us a cut flow index, a very good number of 0.86. You'll, you'll see me, we're going to analyze those things uh, a little bit later. What is the surgical morbidity at 30 day? Uh, if you count everything, there is a significant morbidity in about 10% of the patients, 17 out of the 162. If you look at ischemic stroke and ICH post-op, 
we have one case of the first one, we have five cases of the second one. We've got some subdural hematomas, two of which had to be evacuated, some wound complications, either pseudomeningocele or poor healing, particularly in the 2D2R when you sacrifice both STA branches. We've got some respiratory failures. We've got uh, one, uh, two MIs uh, for surgical morbidity. Um, I don't have time to go in detail with each of the morbidities of the stroke and the ICHs, but we've tabulated the six cases. Just very briefly, uh, by the way, one death. This is the first one, and I'm going to, I think I put a slide to show you the, yes, I put the video of that case, very unusual case. A uh, patient I had to use was so-called bonnet bypass. The common carotid, was, common carotid was occluded on one side, so I could not use the STA of that side, so I used the STA of the other side with a saphenous vein crossing over. This is uh, described many years ago by Spetzler, uh, surgery was going very well, but unfortunately, this is a dramatic, uh, uh, I, I know I'm going to sound like I'm blaming it on, on it, but it is a case, a dramatic anesthetic complication with the patient allowed to wake up uh, out of their muscle relaxants and uh, um, um, uh, developed significant post posterior fossa hemorrhage uh, and death. Um, the other cases are, again, no, we're not going to go over the details, stroke, hemorrhages. Uh, some of them did very well in spite of that complication. That's case four, five, and six. And you can see the, some of the details of their follow-up. Collateralization pre-op versus bypass occlusion. So this is an interesting point, uh, and I'm glad we looked at this because this was really Nick. Uh, Nick Khan's suggestion is to look at the complete versus incomplete collateralization, and it made a huge difference. So if in retrospect, the, complete uh, the patients had complete collateralization, eight of the 22 cases, that's 36%, occluded long-term. We're not talking about acute occlusions. We're talking long-term follow-up. Interestingly, if on the reverse, they had incomplete collateralization pre-op. The delayed occlusion rate was very low, 4%. So it's a, and statistically significant with a very low p-value. If you look at it graphically, here it is. In blue are the completely collateralized uh, pre-op, and in orange, comp incompletely collateralized. And you can see the relative difference of both. Now, mind you, when I say complete collateralization, these patients still had symptoms. I haven't operated on asymptomatic patients, still had uh, low VMR or low SPECT. So there was certainly ground to operate on those patients. Uh, but you can see that uh, they need their bypass less over time. And as I said, many of them have indirect collateralization build up over time. What are the clinical outcomes? Well, patients did better. So the average MRS pre-op in blue was 1.8, and average MRS post-op became 1.2 at last follow-up. So we are certainly helping patients uh, with this procedure, at least the way we've, we've described it. Does the technique affect the results? Meaning, does it matter if I use 1D1R, 1D2R, or 2D2R, no. If you look at it statistically, there is no statistical difference between the two. But uh, you notice I have only 24 1D2R. I have only 22 2D2R. Perhaps as I get more of those patients, perhaps a significance will arise. But you can see a little trend. Look at, for example, long-term. Well, no, look at cut flow index. It is higher the more donor you give. So uh, the 2D2R has a cut flow index more than one. <coughs> if you look at long-term patency rate, there is a trend for increased patency by using 2D2R or even 1D2R. 
uh, versus 1D, 1R. Uh, I've discussed with you last time, I'm not going to repeat it, the, the basic hemodynamics of bypass, uh, Hagen Poiseuille's equation, the resistors in parallel and in series, what's the difference, and so forth. And uh, that uh, paper has been uh, accepted and will be published uh, imminently. Uh, and hopefully, doc uh, our wonderful Suazo's illustration hopefully will make it on the cover of the JNS. Uh, we'll see if they if they like it enough. But that's that would be it. Uh, discussing the one D two R construct and the resistors, and uh, that's uh, we're not going to go over that. I discussed this with you last time. And what do the various resistances mean? So. Looking at univariate and multivariate analysis of the delayed bypass occlusions, we're trying to learn well, 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 who occludes in a delayed manner, even if it's asymptomatic. There were only two factors. We looked at everything. Uh, I can explain one, I cannot explain the other. Race, the His Hispanics had a more likely, uh, uh, more likely to occlude in a delayed manner. So if you look at the number, 44% uh, uh, of the occluded, delayed occlusions were Hispanic, while the Hispanics made up 20% of the patent bypasses. I don't have a good explanation for that. Is it genetic? I don't know. The follow-up is the same in everybody, pretty much. Uh, the second factor is the complete versus incomplete collateralization. And as I showed you earlier, dramatic difference, whether patients had uh, incomplete collateralization, uh, then they were more likely to stay, uh, I mean, to, uh, to stay patent. Uh, otherwise, of relevance, I'll come back to that cut flow index, which Charbel has published repeatedly on as a very good predictor of long-term patency, is not a predictor, at least in this series. Um, um, so let me show you a couple of examples before the discussion. Um, uh, this is a 1D 2R example. Uh, I am not going to show you the entire videos of all the examples, just to show you some technical things. Typical Moya Moya. Uh, classic incision using only the parietal branch of the STA and sparing the frontal branch. You isolate it under the microscope. Uh, I like to use the, the ICG, uh, the, the so-called GLOW, just to visualize it. And I do the same when I do the bypass later. I cut the STA and I measure the flow. You will see the cut flow here was 50 cc per minute. So that's what the STA is capable of giving. We do the craniotomy. And then we identify, in this case, two recipients one on the temporal lobe, one on the frontal lobe, put the background material. You do side to side. Uh, by the way, make measurements of the recipient flow before you start. In this case, frontal was four, temporal was two. Note the direction. Is it integrate or retrograde? This is the ICG. Uh, the anastomosis in this case is uh, running. You fish mouth the donor to increase the cross-sectional area. We're not going to go over that. Uh, I measure the flow after I finish this anastomosis. In this case, it's 43 cc per minute. Then I do the second anastomosis to the temporal, and that's side to side. Side to side, of course, is a little different technically. Uh, you have to do, well, not you have to, but usually you do running suture. You could do it interrupted if you flip the artery. Uh, so we finish that. Now we measure the flow. And that's what the subject of the 1D2R paper is, is to compare the shift in flow. Now, remember, we started with 50 cc per minute uh, cut flow. Now the total flow after both anastomoses were done is 60. So it's more, the cut flow index is higher than one, is like 1.2. And that's what I found quite commonly in the 1D2R construct, which is probably why long term patency will hopefully prove to be better than 1D1R 
with larger numbers of patients. And here is a summary of the flow measurements. And that's the closure at the end. Here is a post-op angio showing a nice patent. Both anastomoses are patent, the side to side and, <coughs> and the end to side. And patient did very well. 2D2R is of course easier to understand is you use both branches of the STA uh, to two different branch to do different recipient. There is nothing really useful technically, ex well, except to show what's the difference. Of course, it's more tedious because you have to go find the anterior branch in the scalp. Here it is. Uh, so that's, you can see it's, it's a little more tedious. There is a little higher risk of skin necrosis because you've devascularized at least partially the skin flap. And that's why I don't particularly like it, which is why I prefer 1D 2R. But it's simpler in the sense that you can screw up one of the anastomoses. It doesn't screw up the other one because it's two independent donors, as opposed to 1D 2R, where you're relying on the one branch you're using. We're not going to, I'm not going to show this, but one anastomosis end to side the other anastomosis end to side. And I think the flow measurements, uh, I don't think I have them in this video, but uh, again, good flow post-op and good bypass patency. Uh, a, a rare example of posterior circulation ischemia, vertebrobasilar insufficiency using the occipital artery to the pica. Uh, again, the vertebrobasilar insufficiency, I, um, as many of our stroke neurologists like to say, is really an orphan disease because it tends to be neglected. This is a classic VBI case. You can see there is barely any visible basilar artery, uh, uh, daily TIAs. So here is the occipital artery, which can be a very nice donor to an anastomose to the pica. And uh, here is a setup. It's tedious to dissect it, but uh, it's a well-known technique. You Doppler it, you dissect it, you do the uh, posterior fossa craniotomy. And actually, there is quite a bit of room to do the bypass because, you know, as you know, there is plenty of room uh, at the foramen magnum here. So you can see the medulla, you can see the lower cranial nerves, and then you identify the pica. And here is the pica. Now, of course, what is the pitfall is you don't want to injure any of the brainstem perforators. You have to be very cognizant of what is a safe perforator free segment to choose to put the, S, the occipital artery into it. So here I am trying to mobilize the pica to bring it closer to me. And I'm being very careful that I'm not avulsing any perforators here between the lower cranial nerves. You can see this perforator right here, so I cannot pull the pica any further. But that's good enough to do the, the anastomosis. And we are going to, I'm measuring here how much of the occipital artery I need. I cut it, fill it with heparinized saline, and we're going to do, you can see there's quite a bit of space, even though, of course, it's deeper than, than an STA MCA, but we're going to do the anastomosis is in a usual manner, temporary clips. Uh, and I think I've done running technique in this case on, I don't know if I did it running, yes, on both sides, or as I said, sometimes I do interrupted on one side, running on the other. And that's after finishing the anastomosis, uh, uh, patient did very well. Here is a post-op angiogram. Uh, here's a closure of the dura, of course, is not watertight. No and then you augment it with uh, collagen. Here's a post-op angiogram, the occipital artery, you can see the end to side anastomosis into the pica and filling up retrograde, uh, retrogradely into the basilar artery. But of course, you have to select those patients very appropriately to make sure they have a recipient bed to receive the bypass flow. This is a patient that ended up uh, in death. I'll, uh, unusual, difficult case. Uh, here is the common carotid occlusion. Here is the STA that had, of course, poor flow in it because it's on the side of the common carotid occlusion. 
So I uh, dissected it anyway to measure the flow and see maybe by miracle there is enough. Uh, you can see the flow is only 7 cc per minute and it was retrograde. So it's not a suitable donor. So I did a bicoronal incision, went to the other STA on the other side. Here is a saphenous vein, uh, sutured it to the STA bifurcation of the opposite side. That's a, it's a good way when you have discrepancy between vessels, go to the bifurcation point. This way it will match, uh, both vessels will be better matched. The flow here was actually very good. I don't remember if I put the number, yes, uh, 77, 77 cc per minute is incredible amount of flow from just an so-called just an STA. So I suture it to the saphenous vein. And here is going contralateral Sylvian fissure. And again, unfortunately, this is where during this anastomosis that there were uh, um, uh, patient became unstable while I'm suturing, the brain began to swell. And you can, you will see why in a second I completed the anastomosis. Actually, the flow was 53. But here is a post op. Look at the posterior fossa, severe uh, hemorrhages bilaterally, like tiger striping bilaterally in the posterior fossa, very far away from the, you can see the patent anastomosis. Um, and the patient died a few days later. So direct bypass is really a highly effective method in selecting, uh, in select Moya Moya disease, Moya Moya syndrome and steno-occlusive disease. In our clinical material, stroke was in 60%, TIA 31%, ICH 8%. This is typical North American um, series as opposed to, uh, to the Asian series where you have more hemorrhages as presentation. Uh, I noted, as I said, incomplete collateralization in 76% of the cases. Um, the, I, I don't have time to go over a full discussion of the steno-occlusive disease group, but they certainly did better than what has been published in the COS study, as you know, the carotid occlusion study that has been controversial. And uh, luckily, our group, both neurosurgically and our stroke neurologist, um, are smarter than that and certainly know how to select patients that uh, are appropriate for uh, select bypass uh, among the atherosclerotic group based on individualized medicine, really, concept. Uh, next topic is the feasibility of the bypass. So I only failed to achieve a patent bypass during the surgery in one of 162 cases. Uh, as I told you, two more failed during the admission. And uh, the long-term uh, occlusion is 9.8%. So no, about 90% were patent long-term, 100% were patent in the operating room. And the CFI is median of 0.86 which is of course much higher than the so-called desired 0.5. The final bypass flow was 52 cc per minute median. Essentially, it shows you the brain takes what it needs. The demand uh, uh, orders the supply. Uh, and that's what was needed in those cases. Now, I have to address what has puzzled me and what is puzzling me is uh, CFI discrepancy with the University of Illinois in Chicago series, the work of Sharbel and Amin Hanjani. So here is, uh, I pulled their paper of 2019, and I think it's very, uh, it's, it's very useful to compare the two series to see how come, uh, very similar techniques, I think, our series and theirs, how come CFI in their case is very predictive of long-term patency and, it, and ours is not. So let's look at the two comparisons. The UIC data is 146 cases, uh, ours is 161, by the way, where I'm talking about patients where we have flow measurements intra-op. There was one patient of mine, I did not measure flow, I couldn't. So that's why 161, not 162. The cut flow ranges are similar in both. 
Look at the mean cut flow, very similar. Theirs was 56, ours were 58. The bypass flow range, once a bypass was constructed, their range was from zero to 115. Ours is from eight to 198. So generally higher. You will see in a second why that is. The bypass flow mean is 44 for them, 49 for us. They have slightly higher percentage of steno-occlusive disease compared to Moya Moya, 44% versus 32. There were two surgeons in their series, uh, Fadi Sherbel and Sepi Amin Hanjani. There was just me in our series. Uh, I'm talking about operating, operating surgeons because you have to account for heterogeneity of technique. Now, here is, I think, an important consideration. 1D2R and 2D2R, uh, I did more percentage-wise than they did. So 29% of my series is one of those two variants. 17% of theirs is one of these two variants. And as I showed you, there is more flow with those variants. So perhaps that explained the CFI discrepancy. But there is another very important factor. They use concomitant EDAS along with the direct bypass, meaning they do the anastomosis and then they lay specifically the dura or they invert it. It's not clear how they do it specifically in addition to the bypass in, third, in more than a third of their cases. I don't do it, essentially. I did it in one case. So I think between the 1D2, 2R, 2D2R discrepancy of percentages, the concomitant use of EDAS, the follow-up is essentially the same. Theirs is slightly longer, 2.1 years. Ours is 1.75 years. Uh, now, their long-term patency rate is not as good as ours, probably because of these factors. I don't think it's technical. Uh, their short-term patency is very good, but their long-term patency is 76% on that 2.1 year follow-up. Ours is 91% on a 1.75 year follow-up. But here is where the CFI is, again, interesting to compare. If, if I categorize the CFI from 0 to 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to 1, 1 to 2, and more than 2, and I broke it down in their series, what their specific bypass occlusion rate is, and look at, and no wonder it's predictive in their series, is 54% occlusion rate if their CFI was less than 0.5 then it drops to 21, it drops to 11 as the CFI rises. Look at our series on the right. It doesn't matter what the CFI is. It's 11% regardless, up to two, CFI of two. So that's what the discrepancy is. I think the explanations uh, I'm, I'm giving is correct, but uh, I'm not sure. A concomitant EDAS, our use, a more prevalent use of 1D2R or 2D2R uh, versus theirs. So um, in summary, and I'll finish with this, uh, using direct bypasses in adult, Moya Moya disease, Moya Moya syndrome, and select atherosclerotic cases is clearly much better than natural history. I remind you the natural history in general is a five-year cumulative stroke rate of 82% if you do nothing. We have a, long, a very good long-term bypass patency of 90%. Even those who occluded long-term were asymptomatic and had excellent secondary uh, neovascularization through the indirect uh, uh, route. The post-op morbidity is very acceptable, one death, uh, in 162 cases and stroke or ICH in 3.7%. And I think, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. And I don't know if any of our uh, stroke neurologists have been able to join us. And uh, I guess there, is a f there are a few minutes uh, for questions. Thanks very much. I, again, many thanks, particularly to Nick, who's done really the yeoman's work and all the residents who helped collect the data and analyze and review the angiograms and so forth. Many thanks for the team effort here. And of course, many thanks to the rest of the neurology group for the collaboration on these cases.
Jacques? Yes. This is okay. Jose Romano. Okay. Great talk. Congratulations. This is a tremendous uh, work. It, I, I joined a couple of minutes late and perhaps I missed it, but um, you had long-term follow-up on all of the cases. You didn't have lost to follow-up. Oh no, I wish. Oh no, no. I had the mean follow-up was 1.75 years. Uh, we have you know, many of the early cases, Jose, very, very difficult uh, to, and we tried. I mean, I, I had a whole team of residents, nurses. You know how it is, patients move here in South Florida. Of course. I, I, don't, I don't, and unless you can think of a better way, I'd love to capture those many of the early cases. I mean, I have some of them. My longest follow-up is 21 years, but no, I, I don't have follow-up on everybody. So, so what was the, uh, the one-year risk of clinical stroke? Uh, if you, well, if you, if you include the periop morbidity, is about 3.7%. And, and if you would do the, the beyond 30 days? There were, I, I don't have that broken down. I can only go, and that's where I need your input for probably a second, secondary analysis and... Uh, and, and I don't have that in detail. In, in the records, it's, you know, it's, it, you, you, it's not easy to tease out. Sure. So what we, it's a retrospective review. We reviewed clinical results. We reviewed clinical visits, long-term follow-up. If there was no mention of a TIA or a stroke, we assume it did not happen. We, of course, have the radiologic follow-up. Sure. Uh, but whether there are some unsuspected you know, subtle events we're missing. I'm sure there are, uh, but would love to have your help with that. But your radiological follow-up was uh, present in a, in a significant proportion, and those did not have obvious clinical events. Correct. Right? Correct. So this is an, an yes. impressive uh, uh, improve, uh, change. So, so why do you think that this is different from costs, uh, at least in these uh, athero cases? Well, Jose, you know, I'm not, uh, we're not the only series that shows this. You know, you take, you know, experienced surgeons, individual series. Now, of course, as you know, self-reported self, uh, series tend to carry a lot more bias than, than randomized clinical trial. We all know that. But we really try to look. Um, costs, if you go back to, the, to our publication, back our critique uh, of costs, we kind of analyze six important factors. Number one, you remember costs, the PET scan showed improvement in the cases in, in spite of the lack of overall significance. The problem was 15% perioperative surgical morbidity. The co-PI of costs, uh, Grubb, the surgeon in the, with, along with Bill Powell, reanalyzed the data and published it and said, if the m and of the surgery had been as low as 8%, costs would have been positive in favor of uh, bypass surgery. So it's a matter of degree. And there are many other factors. Number two is the exclusion of the so-called hot cases. I mean, as you know, you guys often call us with somebody who's unable to sit in the on their ICU bed. They they get TIA setting up. These cases have been excluded from costs. If you remember, the average randomization time for a cost patient was 72 days. Well, if you can wait 72 days, I mean, these are totally elective cases. So I think the universe of patient selection is different in my series and other, uh, uh, in, in, you know, other uh, single institution reported series compared to to the cost. Cost has fantastic internal validity, limited external validity. You know, and many other things we, we're not going to go into it today. Great. Thank you, Jacques. Again, great but, lecture. But so as I said, this you know, this manuscript is going to you guys later today or tomorrow for, for further input. Uh, but you can see, you know, the team has done quite a good amount of work on it already. Absolutely. Thanks. Any anything else? Otherwise, I will let us all go to our daily work. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody.